Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on building a home office. I'm Bob Hogan, the webinar coordinator and a mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host today. Our presenter today is Cliff Amico. Um, more about Cliff in just a moment, but I'd like to um, give you some brief information on SCORE uh, before we start our webinar. Um, SCORE is a national organization with 11,000 volunteers across the country and 320 chapters. Um, started in the mid-1960s and we're part of the Small Business Administration. Um, right here in Scorefield for County, we have over 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry, process, and subject matter expertise and we offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. Uh, we offer one-on-one -on -one counseling, either face-to-face, -face, telephone, or by email or Skype. Uh, we offer educational workshops and webinars like we're doing today. And we al also offer extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject experts uh, that are at your disposal. Um, our next webinar is gonna be on Tuesday, April 4th, when Bob Zukowski is going to present Google Keyword Planning. So uh, look for the specifics on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org. Um, a, a few comments about today's event before we start. Um, we're going to stop the webinar um, sharply at uh, 1 o'clock, and the conference is being recorded, and the link to the recording and the slides will be available on our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org, within the next few days or so. Um, we have set aside time at the end for um, questions and answers at the end of Cliff's presentation, but uh, we'd encourage you to actually um, type your questions into the chat window, uh, which is on the lower left of side of your screen, and uh, you can do that anytime during the conference. We might take some questions during the session, and uh, we'll take them at the end uh, for sure. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Cliff Enico, our speaker. Uh, Cliff is a frequent SCORE workshop presenter and a nationally recognized small business legal and tax expert. His weekly advice column, Succeeding in Business, is syndicated nationally and appears in dozens of major newspapers and small business websites across North America. An attorney and small business consultant based in Fairfield, Connecticut, he has helped over 15,000 businesses during his 36-year career and is the author of 16 books. I'll now turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, all yours. Hey, thanks, Bob, very much, and, and welcome to our, our program today on one of my favorite topics, something I live daily, uh, working out of a home office. A uh, little, little full disclosure, Bob did a great job of introducing me, um, but uh, I have been practicing law for 36 years. Uh, for 20 of those years, I have been practicing law out of the spare bedroom of my home uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut. Most of the time, I am naked. Um, you did hear that right, yes, and that's a visual. Those of you who have met me, it's a visual. You will never forget it. But I'm actually serious. I, I actually have probably the only clothing optional law practice in the northeastern United States, I think I have some competitors in California out on the west coast here, but on the east coast, I think I pretty much have that market to, to myself. And it is rather, the only, it's actually not bad. The only thing is it's kind of hard attracting associates and paralegals and stuff like that. I, I have a tough time with my recruiting on that. But seriously, I mean, and obviously I'm not really naked. I'm wearing my bathrobe, my bunny slippers, and, and things like that. Yes, I do own bunny slippers. But, but seriously, it, it is a change in your life. Uh, for you know, most of my career, I had worked in offices uh, first for some large law firms in New York, and then as a as a solo lawyer here in Connecticut. And I just decided at one time I just didn't need it anymore. Most of my clients were working out of their homes, uh, so why shouldn't I follow suit? And it is a change, uh, and a major change, and something you need to think of a lot of thought to if you're going to do it. So uh, let's let's begin. Let's start talking about this a little bit. Okay. Um, first of all, there we go. Just got to move the slides. Okay, so we got to use the mouse. Okay. Never trust a lawyer with technology. Okay. There we go. Now, if you didn't believe I was a lawyer, now you do. Uh, just a couple of things before we begin. So the two things that you really need to know here. Number one is that while you know I do a lot of work with SCORE, I am not an employee of the SCORE organization uh, or a counselor or anything like that. I just show up and they feed me here. Um, but uh, no, seriously, anything that I say, if you know you, you listen to something I say and it sounds like great advice, and you, t you follow it and it doesn't work out, uh, and you end up, you know, your business fails, you go bankrupt, your spouse divorces you, your dog pees on your leg, and you're living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, you cannot sue Score, you cannot sue me. So there. 
the second thing you need to know about is that while i will be answering some of your questions and i know some of you have very specific legal questions about working out of a home office you cannot really rely on anything i say as one on one advice i really don't know any of you well enough to be able to say this is what you should do in your particular situation uh for that you actually have to hire me and we have to spend some time together i can figure out what you're all about it's a very big difference between saying here's what the law says you should do and here is what you should do so just be aware of that that's true of all scouts uh score seminars but the legal ones especially okay so here's a prediction sooner or later all of us are going to be working from home the department of labor compiles statistics on this and they estimated that there were actually between 10 and 15 million home offices in the united states in 2016. and by the way all of them are illegal uh including mine uh we'll talk about that in a minute uh business trends favor home-based employment with today's technology let's face it you can work anywhere you do not need to have a physical office to do what most of us do with our livings uh, we are all becoming 1099s and that's another seminar that i do for score um it's something called the uh, it's something called the um the four horsemen of corporate america or why you will not be working for a corporation in the next five to ten years of your life uh present present trends prevail uh, I do this for SCORE all the time. You can also catch it on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com, and search for Cliff Enico. You'll find that one. We're, we're finding that there's a blurring of work and private life. None of us work 9 to 5 anymore with fixed hours. I do a little bit of work on Sunday. I do my shopping on Wednesday afternoons. And there's a growing army of people who live their lives that way, where every day you're doing business stuff, personal stuff, and that kind of thing, rather than the strict nine to five, Monday through Friday that, that most of us older folks remember. But there's also another factor too, which is the desire to reduce overhead to rock bottom. Uh, we live in an economy that, while it's getting a little bit better right now, is still pretty sore here in the United States. A lot of people, a lot of my clients do not have money. They don't want to walk into a big plush office with, with prints on the wall and you know shelves full of books because they know that they're the ones paying for that. They want to see me operating at rock bottom uh, with, with low overhead because that is how they are, are operating themselves, and they expect me to work the same way. Uh, they want me to keep my bills low, so i got to keep my bills low, and that's why working out of the house is a tremendous cost savings for me and for most home-based entrepreneurs. Um, there are different types of home-based workers, contractors and self-employed people, people like myself, virtual companies, more and more I find myself, especially with the younger millennial generation, I find myself working with virtual teams of people where there is no fixed office. They're all working out of their apartments and maybe they have a we work space somewhere, you know, where they, it's like a time sharing thing where they go in several hours a week. When I file a corporate uh, corporation these days or an LLC, the biggest, hardest problem I have is what's the business address of this stupid thing? You know, I, I don't know what that is. And the, and the team has to make a decision. Let's use Joe's address because he's around more often than the rest of us. And he'll, he'll look, at least look at his mail. The rest of us don't. You know, we have to have this discussion. It used to be you never even had to question where the business office was. Now it's a big problem. Uh, Part-timers, stay-at-home parents, people selling on eBay or Amazon, over 1 million Americans make money, either full-time or part-time, selling stuff on Amazon, if you can believe that. Uh, and all of these people virtually work from their home. Uh, a lot of them are in rural America. A lot of them are farmers. This is what they do after the crops come in the fall. Uh, last but not least, telecommuters, uh, fully employed, but these are people who are fully employed in traditional jobs, but they are allowed to work from a home office, either full or part-time every week. There we go. Okay, so can you work out of your home? Okay, I, I made the statement a few minutes ago that every home office is technically illegal. What did I mean by that? Well, what I meant by that is simply this. Your local zoning regulations may not let you work out of your home. Virtually every community in the United States right now has a zoning code or a zoning ordinance. And basically, this is a way that the town plans for development within the community so that things don't get too crazy. You don't have factories next door to schools and stuff like that. It's basically a map of the town divided into areas and these, each area has a function. So, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, quadrant A is where all the residences are. Quadrant B is where all the factories are. Quadrant C is where all the, sto the stores are and the schools are in quadrant B. That's what a zoning code is. And the basic rule of zoning is you cannot have a business in an area 
area that is zoned residential. So if you work here, we can get out of your house, and you are talking out of your home, you are technically engaging in, a, in an illegal activity, one that is being enjoyed by 10 to 12, 15 million Americans right now. So how does that happen? There's obviously a disconnect between the law and reality, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. The second thing, your nosy neighbors may not let you, okay? When you work out of your home, one of your biggest concerns is, what do my neighbors think of this? How visible am I to my neighbors? And we're going to talk about that in a minute, because they're the ones that rat you out uh, to the zoning authorities when, uh, when you get a little too visible. Less, your spouse or significant other may not let you. Depending on what your home environment is like, uh, they may not like the fact that you're traipsing around yelling and screaming at clients during the day when the kids are home and things like that. Uh, you and your spouse have to have a very specific understanding when you are working out of the home. Because uh, you may be working different hours, too, uh, which is another thing, too. If you're working, you know, 24-7 and your spouse comes home at 5 o'clock each day, that's going to be, that's going to create friction within the relationship sooner or later. Lastly, your clients, customers, your brand image may not let you. Now, I'm lucky. I'm a lawyer, but I work mostly with small businesses and entrepreneurs. They don't care that I work out of my home. They actually prefer it because, like I said before, it keeps my costs down. If I was doing wills and trusts, though, uh, that was my practice, estate planning, you know, for wealthy people. I don't know that I could work out of my home. Uh, how comfortable would you be, you know, having hiring an attorney to do your will and then, dra and then driving over to a condo where I'm, you know, playing frisbee with my dog in the front yard? How is, does that really give you the level of confidence in me as an attorney that you need? There are some businesses, sadly, where you do need to have a physical office because that's part of the image that you need to project. And even within the legal profession, there are differences. I don't know too many estate lawyers who work out of their homes because they have to project that image of stability and solidity and the fact that they've been around for a thousand years. So, so these are some of the reasons why you may not be able to, but for almost all businesses these days, you probably can. Okay. Here is the main question you have to ask. If you're thinking about working out of the home, though that last slide was some of the things you have to think about. What's my spouse going to think about it? What's my neighbor's going to think about it? But the big question you have to ask yourself, should I be seeing clients and customers in my home office? That is the big question. Because whether or not you're going to be able to do this hinges a lot on the answer to this question. And believe it or not, there is a very clear and definite answer to this question, no. No, never, ever, ever see clients in the home. I said that very slowly so that all of you can understand me. Unless you have a situation where you live on a large estate and you have an outbuilding or some other specially defined space, like a barn or you know an old garage that you've converted, where you can see clients without disrupting the home life, do not see clients uh, in your home office. Why? Okay, well, there are a number of reasons. Number one, it will make you more visible to your neighbors and community, thereby inviting legal hassles. What do I mean by this? Here's the reality, guys. Every home office in the United States is technically illegal, yet millions of Americans are doing it and nobody is saying boo. Why? Because the vast majority, because in most communities, in virtually all communities, while there is a planning and zoning board that administers the zoning ordinance, there are no zoning police. There's nobody who goes around knocking on doors saying, hey, you got a business here, got a business here, got a business here. Nobody's doing that. Uh, these are laws that are not enforced by government. They are enforced by the community at large and by your neighbors. The only, problem, the only way you will ever get into trouble with your local zoning authorities is if your neighbors or someone who doesn't like you rats you out and reports you to the zoning authorities. And they will only do that if you are making their lives uncomfortable uh, in some way. The key to success in a home office is you have to be invisible. You have to be transparent. Nobody should be able to see that you are working out of the home. That is the key. If you do that, Chances are you will never have any issues at all with your local authorities. I've been working out of my home for 21 years. Most of my neighbors don't even know. Why? Because there are no cars in the street. There are no clients sitting on my lawn waiting to meet with me. Don't laugh. There's no big neon sign on the lawn saying Cliff Enico, attorney at law, office hours, that kind of thing. 
Nobody knows and nobody sees it. Whenever a client needs to meet with me, I go to their offices or we meet in a diner somewhere or someplace that's cheap and easy, Chinese restaurant, deli, something like that, uh, which is one of the reasons why in the year that I, that I, that I left uh, the office environment and started working from home, I gained about 25 pounds. That is, that is a major risk. We'll talk about that in a minute, by the way, uh, some of the personal risks you take working out of the house. Uh, but you've got to be careful about that. I never see clients in the home because, and, you know, because I don't want any issues with my neighbors. I don't want them ratting me out to the local zoning authorities. You know, if you are, you know, engaged in a business where there's going to be a lot of noise or a lot of odors, let's say, for example, you want to do a meat rendering plant, a home office, and by the way, don't laugh, there's actually a famous case where a guy was operating a meat rendering plant out of his home somewhere in the Midwest. I don't remember where it was. And it, believe it or not, he operated it for about eight years before the community got together and shut him down. I can only imagine it must have been some rural wooded area or something with nobody near it. I don't know what the story was. But the, a meat rendering plant, that kind of thing, do not do that kind of a business out of your home office. It will really offend your neighbors. Um, but there are other reasons, too, why you shouldn't see clients in the home. Number one, there's an increased risk of slip and fall, dog bite type of things. Your dog decides that your client's not a good person, takes a junk out of his leg. You have liability for that, although you can get insurance for that. It's not something you want to have in your life. Not all clients or customers are nice people. You know, if after seeing three clients in your home, your wife is complaining some of your favorite antiques are missing, uh, that can happen, and it's very hard to prove uh, which of your clients was the one who took it. Um, your spouse or significant other will not want people traipsing through your home. One of the hardest things to persuade a client to do is to take their shoes off uh, before you meet with them. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, or worse yet, give them those plastic booties like the contractors. You really, it just it doesn't really do much, especially for the lawyer-client relationship. Hi, I'm your lawyer. Would you please put these booties on? It's not the kind of thing you really want to do. Uh, it's not a really a good brand image thing. Lastly, but not, do you really want your clients to customers to see how you live or know where you live? Let's say you're a criminal lawyer dealing with people who are fighting jail time. Do you really want these people to know where you live? I mean, trust me, you know, you probably believe that they're innocent most of the time, but do you really want these people, you know, who may be going to jail for long periods of time thinking that you did a bad job for them? Do you really want them and their friends to know where you live? You've got to think about stuff like that. Sadly, we live in a world where you have to think about that, but you do. Okay, so here is the key to home office success. Like I said, invisibility. Okay, how do you achieve invisibility? Don't use your home address for business purposes. You know, if people, if the local kids can't play basketball on the street because they're too busy dodging UPS and FedEx trucks going to your house every few hours, your neighbors sooner or later will get upset and they will rat you out. Get a, um, a P.O. box or, a lot of people don't know this, the UPS stores offer private mailbox service. They used to be known as mailboxes, etc. years ago. Uh, if you have a UPS store in your community where you can send stuff and ship stuff by UPS, they also, almost all of them, have a, um, a, a private mailbox facility uh, that you can, where you can actually rent a mailbox. It costs usually anywhere between $10, $20, dollars a month, depending on the size of the box. But the beautiful thing is, unlike a P.O. box, you get an actual address, 123 Main Street, suite number 456. Okay? It's just a box but it makes you look more like a real business. If you see Cliff Enico, Attorney at Law, P.O. Box 123, that kind of looks a little bit fly-by-night, doesn't it? It looks like the kind of business that advertises in the backs of comic books. Uh, you don't really want to be working with a lawyer who advertises like that. So if you're concerned at all about your image, the UPS store will give you a P.O. Box for about the same price that the post office charges, but you get an actual street address which makes you look a lot more official, much better for, in terms of your advertising and your branding. Uh, I, I really recommend them. The cost is fully deductible. Uh, and also, too, they're in a commercial zone. You don't have to worry about the zoning issues anymore. It also gets you out of the house at least twice a day. Uh, in the morning when you go to drop off your mail, in the afternoon when you pick up your mail and you check your mailbox, um, they, will, they can forward your mail. Uh, I travel a great deal, uh, so I love my UPS store. If I'm, if I'm in St. Louis for a week, or, or if I'm in California doing one of my eBay things, I can just call them up and they will overnight my mail to me so I can stay on top of things. As a lawyer, that's very important. I can't just leave things in my box for days on end. Um, you know, use this address always when registering your trade name or DBA. It solves a lot of problems. 
I'm a big fan of the UPS stores. Uh, for those of you who don't know where it is, go to www.theupsstore.com, theupsstore.com, and you'll see there's a box where you can type in your zip code, and you will automatically find the, um, uh, the nearest uh, UPS store to you. There are some other chains that do this kind of work, but I'm just a big fan of the UPS stores. They really make your life so much easier when you work out of your home. Uh, consider renting conference room space from local professional firms. Um, there's a local law firm in my hometown that lets me, when I do have a closing where I've got four or five people in a room who are all signing like hundreds of documents, where I really need a physical place, there's a local law firm that will let me use their conference room, they, uh, and they're one of their, their staff people. They don't charge me. Of course, I make sure to refer business to them. Uh, that's too big for me to handle. There's got to be a little quid pro quo there. But a lot of these offices have office space, and they're perfectly willing to rent it out to you at very reasonable rates. Uh, see clients in their offices wherever possible or in a neutral location, consistent with your brand image, and avoid noise, especially at night. Lots of cars in your driveway, noxious odors that will give you away. They'll just be invisible. No signs on the lawn, that kind of stuff. If, you, if your house looks like a normal house, you won't have a problem. Okay, home-based businesses are not for sissies, folks. It takes discipline. It takes discipline. Not everybody is cut out to work from a home office. I'll be very honest. I have a lot of lawyer friends who say they simply cannot do it. Uh, they simply, the idea of getting up and not putting on a jacket and tie is something that they just can't get over. Uh, they just can't do it. No, really, lawyers are like that. Uh, they are a lot of professionals are too, not just lawyers. Here are the seven enemies of the home-based entrepreneur. Loneliness is a big factor. There are entire weeks where I do not see carbon-based life forms at all, especially when I'm writing one of my books and I'm on deadline. I can go entire 14, 16-hour days and never see a soul. And that can get you after a while. You have to have a rich interior life to work out of your home. And you have to be very disciplined about how you use your time, which is the most important thing. Your spouse or family members, your pets, can be huge distractions. If you are on a conference call, you don't want to know that the baby needs changing right then or the dog has to go out, okay? Somebody has to be managing that. If you are living in a situation where your spouse and family members are around, they have to know that between X a.m. and Y p.m., that is your time and you are not to be interrupted uh, in a very big way. Honey-do lists can be major problems when you work out of your home. When I first started working out of my home, uh, I made a very strict deal with my wife. She gets one honeydew a day. I will do one chore for her and for the house every day during working hours. She can pick it. She can pick which one I do. I'll do whatever she wants me to do, but she only gets one. I don't want a situation where I'm wandering around town running errands for two or three hours of, of the day disrupting my workflow and not getting contracts done. That is something that a deal that we made very early on, and, and she was cool with that. Temptations, the refrigerator. A gym membership, I think, is in a sense, is an essential when you work out of your home. Uh, I was, when I used to work in, on Wall Street, I worked in these giant office buildings where it took you literally a half an hour to get anywhere to eat food. So as a result, I skipped meals, or I would keep crackers in my drawer or something like that if I got hungry. Now, I work out of my house. I got the best company cafeteria I have ever had in 36 years. It sits in my kitchen, and it's called the Zero, the Zero Refrigerator, the Sub-Zero Refrigerator. That is a problem. Uh, weight control can be a major issue when you're working out of your homes. Household chores, contractors. Something breaks down around the house. You're the guy working out of the home. Who's going to get to deal with that? Answer, you. Uh, be very careful. Uh, you know, make sure that you keep that to an absolute minimum and make sure it doesn't disrupt your workflow. Habit ritual routine. For the longest time, I used to refer to the iron triangle, which is my home office, my UPS store, and the gym where I worked out three or four times a week. I cannot tell you how many days where I went from one to the other to the other and back, one to the other, the other and back. You can get into a really routine here. Uh, and you've got to watch that. You've got to do things to disrupt that routine and break that routine. Uh, otherwise, you go crazy. Letting yourself go. I, mean, I, I joke about practicing naked. But seriously, for the very first couple of months, that I started practicing out of my home, I had a little yellow post-it note that I put on the door on, from going out to the garage. I had like a, one of those two-by-two two post-it notes, and what it said was, pants, question mark. Okay? you got to do stuff like that. 
You know, you know, I mean, I went from an environment where I was working from Wall Street law firms where you had to look perfect every day. The suit had to look just so, you know, back in the day it was three-piece suits, you know, which no, nobody wears anymore. You know, you had to look a certain way. You had to dress by certain colors, right? Now I live in a world where I sometimes don't shave for two days or three days in a row. I have to think, do I put gel in my hair today? Am I seeing anybody? You know, you've got to think about that. You know, pretty soon you get to the point where you only own one suit, and you're probably going to be buried in it. So my thought is, you know, watch yourself. Uh, you know, maintain your professional image, whatever your line of work is. Okay, your clients and customers, you really have to manage their time. I try not to tell clients that I work out of my home uh, as much as possible. I let them think that the UPS store address is a real office. Why do I do that? Because I find that once they know you work out of your home, they think that you're always there. They start calling you Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m when you really don't want to be bothered with a contract that has to be turned around by Monday. They start doing things like that because they figure, well, Cliff's working, he'll, he'll be there. He'll get my message. Um, make sure you, when you do your email, I always, uh, on your voicemail message, always make sure you put down office hours. Uh, you know, available, uh, you know, calls returned 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Saturday, whatever it is you do. Make sure you do that. Build in the expectation that there are times where you're not going to respond to them. Otherwise, you will be working 24-7 and you will be a slave to your job, which you do not want. The whole purpose of working out of your home is to give you more flexible time. Um, the lack of physical time barriers between work and private life, you can work any time. The office is always there. Every time I pass my spare bedroom, I am thinking, oh, there's that contract it's been sitting on my desk for two days. Maybe I ought to take some time today, even though it's Sunday, and do this. Uh, I don't want an angry client. You, that thing is always there. It's like, what's that line from The Godfather? I try to get away, but it keeps pulling me back, pulling me back. And it, it, it can get like that. You've got to be careful about that, um, because otherwise you lose control. What's, what happens with, with, when you work out of your house is every day becomes a work and a family day. Uh, you know, I usually spend at least an hour or two working on Sundays, whether I like it or not. But I can also do my grocery shopping on Wednesday afternoons when there's nobody at the stop and shop. Uh, I can do that. That's the blessing, is I can do things. I don't have to do my shopping on Saturday when everybody is getting their groceries at the same time because they all work in the city. I can do it on Wednesday when there's nobody there. You know, and I've even learned exactly when the grocery store gets their delivery so I can get the freshest produce. You know, I can go there exactly when they're doing the deliveries and get the fresh stuff. That's the fun part of working out of the house uh, is that you can do stuff like that. You know, Wednesday afternoon can be a fun day if you want it to be. Okay, here are the six things you need to work from home. Privacy, very, very important. Your home office should ideally be a dedicated workspace. This is important, too, if you're taking the home office deduction for your town. We'll talk about that for a minute. Um, preferably a separate room, not part of a room that you use for other things. You should be able to concentrate without distractions. Technology, desktop computer or laptop, smartphone, lots and lots of backup. Very important. Physical backup should be in, in, in seriously, I back up all my files. CDs, DVDs, I have detachable hard drives that I use where I can back up my whole computer. I subscribe to at least two cloud services so that if anything ever breaks down at the house, I always have access to what I'm doing. You know, on my smartphone, my laptop, you've got, you've got to have lots and lots of backup. Don't, don't scrimp on this. Uh, consider if you use Microsoft Office, use Office 365 or um, uh, the, they're called OneDrive, which is their cloud service. Do it. Subscribe to it. Pay the 15, 20 bucks a month. It is well worth it. Uh, to be, you've got to be able to get access to everything wherever you're going. Make sure you have space for files, your library. Whether we are slowly moving to a digital world, but we are not there yet. Paper is and dead trees are still a very important part of our life. Uh, we've got to make sure that we that we manage that. Professional telephone coverage, uh, but don't overdo it. If you are working out of your house. Don't do one of those things. Hi, welcome to the law offices of Clifford R. Uh, for Cliff, press 1. Uh, to, leave, to leave a message, you know, for the office manager, press 2. Now, seriously, if, you're off, if your message sounds too corporate and people know that it's just you, it's kind of pompous, to be honest with you. And people get offended. And also, too, while you should definitely use your telephone message as a marketing tool, never, ever make it more than 15 or 20 seconds 
unless you give the person the option to bypass the message. I hate it when I call someone for the tenth time and I've got to listen to his 45-second spiel before. The first time, it's okay. But the tenth time, I just want to leave him the freaking message and move on. So just make sure you do that. Marketing materials, I'm sorry, I usually do this as a live presentation, so there is no handout. Um, you know, but make sure that you, your website and your LinkedIn profile, especially if you're a professional, are of paramount uh, importance. Maybe a virtual assistant. Uh, I've been wrestling this with some time. Uh, I haven't really found anybody that I like yet, which is why I don't use one. Uh, the biggest problem I have with virtual assistants is I haven't found anyone really who's committed to doing this for the long haul. A lot of people who do virtual assistant work are people who are staying home, raising kids, and they just want to you know, uh, make some money for a few hours a week. So you're not sure they're covering your phones. You're not sure that they're forwarding your messages to you on time. Sometimes the people call as a screaming baby in the background. You know, it, it isn't a professional image. Uh, there are companies that do nothing but virtual assistant, but you get a different person each time somebody calls. So there's no continuity. And they mispronounce your name, by the way, uh, especially when you're a guy like me. You know, I, I actually used a virtual assistant company, and I fired them after a month because each time a new person answered the phone, they got stuck pronouncing, hi, uh, welcome to the law offices of Cliff, and they couldn't pronounce my name, so I stopped doing it. If your name is John Smith, though, go for it, uh, or Mary Jones. This doesn't apply to everybody. Okay, how do you protect your home office? You need liability coverage especially if you are seeing clients in the home office, let's say you do have a, a dedicated space like a barn or an outbuilding where you can see them, you've got to get um, basic commercial liability coverage, property casualty. Uh, most people don't know this, but your homeowner's policy uh, does not extend to your home office uh, normally. Uh, however, most policies have what's called a home office rider where for a little additional premium every month, it will cover all your business assets. So if a tree falls on your house and flattens the thing, the, the home office, the home uh, owner's policy will cover replacing the furniture, the artwork, that kind of stuff. But your business assets will not be covered unless you have the home office rider to your policy. Uh, talk to your insurance agent. Usually getting the home office rider is the cheapest way to get coverage for your home office. You could buy a separate policy for your business. If you have a corporation or an LLC for your home business, sometimes people do that. But I think getting the home office rider is, is the cheapest way to go with that. They already know you. You're already insured. They have history with you. So the policy is usually a lot cheaper. You should also, depending on what it is you do, you should also carry errors and omissions uh, insurance. This is basically malpractice insurance. If you're a professional, it's called professional liability. If you're not a professional, it's called errors and omissions. A little dirty secret we lawyers know. Plaintiffs don't really like to go after real estate, even though they can. It's a pain in the butt to get a lien on somebody's house and to get a judge to go along with that. They'd much rather go after a fat, juicy insurance policy. So give them something to go after. Uh, it'll make your life a lot easier, although it's never pleasant to be sued. You know, knock on wood, it's never happened to me. I'm not going to find wood, touch wood. Um, but it's a good thing to have you sleep better at night. Consider maybe transferring title to your home into your spouse's name. Uh, but there's some very strict rules about this. If you do, first of all, your spouse cannot be involved in the business at all. She or she, he or she has to be entirely separate from the business that you do. Also keep in mind that you are making a legal transfer. So if you and your spouse ever get divorced, you're not just going to be single again. You are going to be homeless. I'm going to see you uh, standing on the side of the road by I-95 with a sign saying, we'll do whatever for food and shelter. Uh, you do not want to be in that situation. The last rule, which is a very important rule, if you are transferring title to your house to someone other than a husband or a wife, they must be sure, like, like your mom or a brother or sister, make sure they change their wills so that if they die suddenly, the thing, the asset comes back to you and doesn't get divided up between your 16 siblings. I've had situations where that has happened, uh, by the way. Make sure they change their wills. It's called a specific bequest clause, where if they die, that asset goes back to you and to nobody else. And then you can give it to somebody else if you're so inclined. Okay, now, so I, I talked about the zoning cops. If you're truly invisible, you, you, you probably will have no problem with zoning. But, if you, but when registering, but there are some things you can do, okay, to keep other things you have to do. If you are using a DBA or trade name, so Cliff Enico doing business as Cliff's Antiques, 
you usually have to register that with your town clerk's office or maybe your county clerk's office. There's a form you have to file. Never use a residential address because that's putting them on notice that you're working out of a home. Use your UPS store address or your P.O. box when you fill out that form. For larger businesses, there are some towns, not just in Connecticut but elsewhere, that offer a home occupation permit. For those of you in Connecticut, Wilton, Connecticut has a very simple procedure for getting a home office. And if you get the home office permit, you never have to worry about this. You know, you're registered with the town. Bridgeport, Connecticut also has some rules here. Since a lot of you guys are not in Connecticut, I'm not going to waste a lot of time with this. But if you do a search online for name of your town followed by home office permit or home occupation permit, you'll probably get a page from one of your town agencies that has the list of what you have to do. But don't go crazy with it. As long as you're invisible, even if you don't get the permit, you're probably going to be okay. It will only become an issue if they catch you. Here are some best practices for the home-based business. These actually come from the Bridgeport, Connecticut regulations, by the way. I just like them because they're good best practices. Don't change the residential appearance of your premises or the residential character of the neighborhood. If the local kids can't play basketball on the street because they're too busy avoiding your property, you've got a problem. Customers may visit the premises only from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. If people are showing up at midnight, your neighbors are not going to like that. No more than eight customers or clients per day. No more than two employees other than resident family members. That does not include your dog or cat. Nice try, but you can't do it. Home office may not occupy more than 50% of the gross floor space. Your spouse will have a real problem with that anyway if you do that, but the town will as well. Retail sales of goods must be entirely ancillary. Don't sell stuff from your house. I mean, it's okay for your kids to have a lemonade stand every once in a while. All kids go through that. I encourage that, actually. I always buy from lemonade stands. I always do because I want to encourage entrepreneurship in my community. Just don't hang out too long because otherwise the cops think that you're a stranger danger or something like that. Seriously. I actually had a situation about last summer. I was out on a walk and some kid at a lemonade stand. I knew one of the kids, so I was talking to her for a little bit. Next thing I know, this cop car pulls up, and one of the neighbors had seen me talking to the kids, and they were afraid it was a stranger danger situation. So I had to show my ID and stuff like that and stuff like that. Boy, did I get my butt out of there in a hurry. But seriously, you've got to watch out for stuff like that. But other than that, do not sell stuff. Don't do flea markets on your lawn every week. Okay, we all put stuff out in our driveway that says free every once in a while. But if it starts becoming like tables and stuff and you're out there every weekend, your neighbors are going to have a problem with that. Um, all parking for employees and customers must be on site, not the street. No exterior storage of goods. No hazardous materials. Yeah, watch out for that rendering plant. Uh, no more than one home business on the premises. Those are just best practices. Uh, and I just like them. So, so by doing that, you probably are doing everything you possibly can do to be invisible. Okay, should you take the home office deduction? The answer is absolutely yes. It used to be an audit trigger back in the 90s and early 2000s, but uh, the Supreme Court and the IRS have done a very good job of clarifying the rules. It is no longer an audit trigger. In fact, if you work out of your home, it may be the biggest deduction you qualify for, other than your, your, your Schedule C expenses, uh, your, your ordinary business deductions. Um, here are some tips for taking the home office. First of all, measure your home office accurately. I have always, I have actually participated in some IRS home office audits, and the very first thing the auditor does, he pulls out a tape measure, because he wants to see how big your office is. You know, it, you, you have to know the exact square footage of your home office, and if you just do it by taking a yardstick and going end over end, you're probably getting it wrong. Have a contractor come over. They have professional tools. They'll measure your office accurately, and they will actually give you a letter saying the spare bedroom in the upper northeast corner of Cliff Etico's home at whatever address is exactly 123.456 square feet. Get that, because that will save a lot of time and trouble when you get audited. Uh, if, if you're reporting too much of your house as an office, they will, they will knock you down on audit. Keep personal stuff out of your office. Here is Cliff's rule of thumb. If it doesn't belong in a real office, it doesn't belong in your home office. Real simple. A desk and chairs? Yes. A computer? Absolutely. Yes. Pictures of your spouse and kids, your dog? Yes. A crib? No. Uh, artwork? Yes, if it's appropriate to the business. If you are selling rock and roll posters on
on eBay, you can certainly have rock and roll posters in your office. That You'd have that in a real office, wouldn't you, if that was your business? Exactly. Look out for inappropriate things. Okay, a doggy bed? No, with one exception, unless it's a personal service animal. If you, are, if you are handicapped and you have a service animal, that is always appropriate because you would have that in your real office as well. Otherwise, the doggy bed or the kitty bed has to be somewhere else. And the litter box especially should be in the office, but for reasons I should not have to explain. Okay, it's okay to add storage warehouse. So, for example, a lot of my eBay clients have an office in their home, but they also use their basement or a garage for their inventory. That's okay. You can add that to the uh, home office space, but only the portion that you actually use. The big mistake that people make here is they store stuff in their basement, but then they claim the whole basement as part of the, um, uh, as part of the uh, home office. Believe it or not, the best way to solve that problem, duct tape. And I'm serious. Go into your basement with a roll of duct tape and measure off the space that you use for your inventory or your basement space. Put duct tape around it and then have the contractor measure just that space. Uh, the IRS will buy that, believe it or not. Uh, it's a great tool and yet another one of the many uses for duct tape. What if, what, happens, what if you rent your apartment? Can you deduct your rented portion of your rented apartment? The answer is you can. Can you deduct somebody else's home? Now that sounds like a strange question, but believe it or not, I have a lot of people who sell on eBay. They don't have a basement or a garage, but they have a neighbor with, a, a, with an outbuilding. And they let them, the neighbor lets them use it for storage. Okay? You cannot deduct a home office that's not part of your home. What you have to do, if you're, if you're in that situation, the way you get around that is you lease the space from your neighbor and you pay them rent uh, for the space, because then you can deduct the rent for the space. That's how you get around that. It's not a home office deduction. You can deduct the rent, just like you would for a storage facility, like a Westie's storage bin or something like that. You could do that. Um, can you deduct out-of-home expenses, uh, such as lawn care? Believe it or not, the answer is you cannot. The rule states that you can only deduct things, services that happen within the four walls of your of your home. You cannot do things like um, uh, lawn care or stuff like that. Also, too, the expenses have to be appropriate to the type of business that you have. So, for example, if you are a movie star and you have a personal masseuse come over three times a week and give you a massage, well, you might be able to deduct that, uh, since that is your image is obviously a big part of what you are as a, as a um, as a um, as a movie star, if you are a lawyer or an accountant, that will not work. Uh, you know, a massage is not really considered. Most people really don't give a rasputi what their lawyer or accountant look like. I hate to tell you, I hate to say that, but it's absolutely true. Your image, your personal body image, is not a part of who you are. Also, too, especially if the masseuse is young, blonde, and Scandinavian, your spouse will have a problem with this. So do not do it anyway. It's just a very bad idea. Uh, when you take the home office deduction, uh, make sure you fill out IRS Form 8829. You attach it to your 1040. Read the instructions. The instructions to 8829 are actually very clear. The IRS did a pretty good job of, of, of describing the do's and don'ts for the home office deduction because so many people were getting them wrong. Um, and it's probably the best way to learn how to do it the right way. Okay. There are times, as much as I'm a big fan of the home office, there are times when you do need a real office. When you have more than one employee working on site, the more employees you have, the harder it's going to be to stay invisible. So if you've got five, six people working you know, in your garage, it's just going to look weird after a while. You probably are going to have to gravitate to a real office. When you have to see more, or more than two or three customers a day, when your brand image requires a physical location, uh, let's face it, many Fortune 500 corporations started out in the garage, but they're not there now. Venture capitalists do not invest in home-based businesses. They want to see a real facility with rent and everything like that. Last but not least, when your spouse or significant other insists that you get out of the house, and sooner or later this will happen, uh, depending no matter what kind of your other business you're in, if you're getting in their way. So here's my summary. Sooner or later you'll be working out of a home office, so definitely you should consider it. Unless it's absolutely necessary, don't see clients or customers in your home office. Seriously, that is the big factor in staying invisible. Whether or not your home office is zoning compliant, it probably won't matter as long as you are invisible and nobody cares. Because let's face it, here's the dirty secret. A lot of your neighbors are working out of their homes too. And they're not telling you about that. And you don't even know about that. But if they rat you out at some point and you discover that they're working out of their homes too, well, as we say, turnabout is fair play. 
and they know that. So it's a little bit of honor among the thieves. You know, you don't you don't talk about mine, I won't talk about yours. Okay, you know, a little honor among thieves is a good thing. Dirty little secret, but very true. Uh, I will tell you, there are five people on my street who work out of their home offices, and our neighborhood is very well behaved. Okay, if you qualify for the home office, you, a deduction, you're crazy not to take it. Learn the rules. It, it is a little complicated, but learn how to do it. It saves you a ton of money in your taxes. Get a really good insurance person to help you get the right coverage for your home office equipment, data, et cetera, and don't get crazy with deductions. I, I know eBay people that try to deduct their dog as a guard dog. Okay, don't get crazy with that, because that invites audits. Whenever you take aggressive deductions like that, things that people want, make people wonder how, how much of a vivid imagination you have, those are the kind of deductions the IRS loves to audit. Uh, here's my rule. Generally speaking, the more fun an activity is, the less likely it is to be deductible on your taxes. The IRS auditor is a miserable person living a very miserable life. You know, seriously, these people, these people live like trolls. They really do. And when they see that you're having too much fun in your home-based business, these people get jealous. They are jealous. They're working in a cubicle in the sub-sub-basement of an IRS building somewhere in Leavenworth, Kansas, and they are, they are jealous as hell of the life that you are living. If you start taking crazy deductions like your dog and, you know, travel to Barcelona, Spain, they're going to audit you because they hate you and they're going to want to bring you down. So don't do that. Don't give them the temptation. Don't give them an excuse uh, to go after you if they don't. Uh, if, 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 if otherwise, you're not doing anything. Uh, there are actually rules, by the way, uh, for how you can deduct a dog as a guard dog. Uh, if you want, we can discuss that during the Q&A. But they're very tough rules to uh, to comply with. And almost, I hate to say it, as much as we all love our pets, most of your dogs will not qualify under the IRS rules. So don't even bother doing it. Okay, guys, that's all I have to say. Here are two of my, my current best sellers. Uh, the eBay Sellers Tax and Legal Answer Book, I actually have a whole, because most eBay sellers work out of their home, I actually have a whole chapter in there on the home office deduction uh, where I, I repeat a lot of the stuff I said in this program. And for those of you who haven't had enough of me, uh, this is what I look like when I am dressed uh, and not working out of my home office. Um, you know, uh, and that photo is not actually airbrushed. So uh, picture, that, picture that in the bathrobe and bunny slippers. And, and you have the image. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, let's open the floor for some questions. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, thanks, Cliff. Um, uh, we're now, uh, we'll use the rest of the time. We've got about 10 minutes or so left. And uh, again, a reminder, if you have questions on any of the topics that uh, Cliff covered, um, you can just use the chat feature in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen and uh, just type the question in there, and, um, and we'll ask uh, Cliff to address it. Give people a minute or two here, Cliff. Okay. All ready? Okay, we're looking for some text here. Actually, while we're doing this, the whole thing, there we go. Um, Okay, I missed the first 15 minutes due to technical issues. Can I access that? Bob, you are going to be replaying this. Yeah, we, um, the, we will be putting the uh, a recording and the slide materials up on the um, fairfieldcounty.score.org website within the next uh, couple of days. So you will be able to uh, listen to the presentation there on the recording. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, while people are putting their questions in, the whole thing about the guard dog is actually kind of funny. Uh, it's one of my favorite jokes that I tell. I use it in a lot of my presentations. The eBay people especially love it uh, because they all try to do stuff like that. Here are the rules. I, I'm actually responsible for these rules, by the way. Um, somebody, um, ah, but we do have a question here. Should I show my home business on Google Plus Map? That's a very interesting question. The answer is how essential is it to your business that people know where you are? If you're seeing clients in the home, obviously, you want them to find you easily. But the trade-off is you are disclosing where your business is. And if you have a neighbor or a nasty person who becomes an enemy, that could be evidence number one against you. It's like going to the town and registering your business using the home address. At that point, you pleaded guilty at that point. So I would say unless it's absolutely necessary to your business from a marketing perspective, the answer is no. You can get around this by using the UPS store, because then you don't have to tell people you work out of the home. You can only tell the people you want to that you work out of your home. The rest of the world only sees a UPS store in a strip mall in the middle of a suburb, or so some
on every other UPS store. So I think you're better off that way. It's a tough call, but my answer is no. Okay. Another reason, by the way, not to be too visible with your um, with your business. Uh, there are the websites like Zillow that have the satellites that are taking pictures of your home in real time. You know, if they see a big sign on your roof saying Cliff Enico, attorney at law, even though it's not visible from the street, I think your local zoning authorities might have. Don't laugh. There are a lot of people who have barns and stuff who put their, um, their stuff on the top of their roofs specifically for that reason. So the passing planes and stuff can also see it, you know, and hang gliders and stuff like that. So seriously, if you're going to do that, don't do that. Okay, let's go back to the guard dog thing. I, I love talking about this. Here are the rules. I'm actually responsible for these rules. Uh, when I started doing the eBay stuff about 10 years ago, um, they, uh, this is one of the very first questions that I got, is can I deduct my, my dog as a guard dog? And I didn't know how to answer it, so I actually wrote the regional office of the IRS here in Hartford, Connecticut, and they sent me, I will never forget this, they sent me an email that was eight pages long with rules on whether, on the IRS rules, believe it or not, there's eight pages of rules on whether you can deduct your dog as a guard dog. And here are the rules. Number one, only certain breeds and mixes qualify. Not all dogs do. Your dog must have a propensity for violent behavior. And only certain, I, you cannot make this up. Um, there are only certain breeds and mixes that qualify. German Shepherd, yeah. Uh, Pitbull mix, yep. Uh, what we used to call a Belgian Shepherd, which is half Collie and half German Shepherd, very vicious breed. Good choice uh, for a guard dog. Doberman, yep. Uh, Pomeranian, no. Um, you know, uh, Shih Tzu, probably not. Uh, size does matter. Usually, the smaller the dog, the more likely it is to get stolen as part of the theft. So, although I really think they ought to make an exception here, uh, and that exception is for the Yorkshire Terrier. Any of you who have a Yorkie out there, you know what I mean by you know the Yorkshire Terrier, the little rat dogs that are only about six inches long? These things are vicious little bastards. These are, seriously, these dogs have zero fear at all. I have seen Yorkies take on dogs that are 20 times their size and win. If you've got three or four Yorkies in your basement protecting your inventory, that's kind of like having a pool full of piranha in your swimming pool. You know, the IRS order will be reduced to a skeleton in 30 seconds with these things. I really think they ought to do a Yorkie exception to this. But right now, the exception doesn't exist. Size does matter. Uh, the dog should be big enough to deter a thief. Rule number two, the dog must, if you have a qualifying dog, um, the dog must be guarding your inventory. It must be actually doing it. So if your inventory is in the basement, but the dog's in the doghouse in the backyard, that will not work. The dog must be actually physically uh, in the same place that the inventory is, guarding it, you know, whatever hours there are. Um, the third rule, no matter how vicious they may be, cats and other animals do not apply. I mean, if you're putting pythons, Burmese pythons, in your basement, that will deter a lot of burglars, but I don't think you can deduct those things. Um, seriously, those of you guys living in Florida, other tropical areas, uh, get a dog. Uh, and, and don't put the Burmese python with the dog. It doesn't work, okay? Um, okay, just trust me on that one. Uh, the, the last thing is, so, so now let's say you have a qualifying dog. They are guarding the inventory. Okay, here's the thing. You can deduct all expenses relating to the dog. So their food, their vet visits, all that stuff. But you cannot deduct the dog itself. What you must do, and I and, and wait for this, because you're not going to believe this. What you have to do, you must deduct, you must depreciate the dog over its useful life. And what is the useful life of a guard dog, you may ask? Answer, it is the average life expectancy of that particular breed or mix as determined in writing by a local breeder. You have to get a local breeder to examine your dog, or maybe a vet, and basically give you a written statement as to what an average useful life of that dog is if it is well taken care of. Good luck getting that. Um, but if you can, I mean, and, and of course the question, those of you who are tax people, we have any accounts on this call, the question is, well, let me ask you, if the dog dies prematurely, can I recapture any of the depreciation that I've taken? The short answer is, I did ask that question to the IRS. They never responded. I wore them out. I wore them down on this. 
So those are the rules, seriously. If you're thinking about deducting your, guard, your dog as a guard dog, those are the IRS rules, and you can blame me because I am responsible for these rules. Okay, any other questions? It looks like I think we're basically done here, yep. Bob. I think we, we addressed most of what people wanted. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're a very thorough, you're a very thorough clip, and uh, actually maybe we... Uh, Maybe we do have one, one last question here. If I dislike a long drive to work, mainly, mainly for safety reasons, does that mean I cannot live in the U.S.? Well, now that's a political question, okay? That's not really a legal question, um, you know, but like I said, working out of a home office, even though it's technically illegal, okay? I mean, look, if you want to challenge the constitutionality of it, be my guest. I would love to be your lawyer. But, but keep in mind, I am not going to do it pro bono or on a contingency basis, okay? Just keep in mind that if not having being able to legally be 100% compliant with your home office is going to bother you and you do leave the country, just make sure that you're able to get back in again. Okay. All right. Bob? Maybe with that, we'll, uh, we'll wind it up, uh, Cliff. Thanks very much. I think you covered the topic uh, very thoroughly. And uh, just a reminder, um, on our next webinar, we, we do do two webinars a month on the first Tuesday of the month and the third Tuesday of the month. So as I mentioned at the start, our next one is on April the 4th, and the topic is Google Keyword Planning, and Bob Zukowski is going to be our presenter. Um, you all that registered will receive a uh, questionnaire um, with a feedback form. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you could uh, fill that out for us. It really does help us with our webinar program and uh, gives us feedback for future workshops. So on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank everyone who attended today um, on our live webinar, and uh, remember to um, visit our website, uh, fairfieldcounty.score.org, for the uh, replay if you want to revisit any of the slides and the materials. So in closing, uh, Cliff, thank you again uh, very much for everyone, and have a good day, everybody.